Are you uh, stoked by these changes? Yeah. Kerry traditionally have high fielding, beautiful high fielders of a, of a ball, leaping like a salmon and coming down with it untouched in midfield. Yeah, rumour has it that Owen the Bomber listen is back in training with Kerry, then they are back already training. Darrow O'Shea. Darrow in there. Um, Tommy Walsh obviously is going to be back there. And Kieran Donaghy's done a U-turn on his uh, intercounty career. He could just stand there in midfield, catch ball, lay it off, yes. win marks. Well, two, two of the big men in midfield and then two of the big men inside the, the 20 metre line and that would probably constitute about 4.14 in every match. Yeah, so in case anybody's wondering what we're talking about, uh, there have been five significant rule changes suggested by the Standing Committee on Gaelic football playing rules and the committee have asked for the rules to all be considered as a, as a collective, that they come as a package and let's play with them for a year and see what happens. So they were put out yesterday, published, they will be debated a little bit and then they'll go to... Uh, the GA's management committee for implementation and trial basis for the league next year and at that point there'd be a congress and then there'd be a uh, championship 2020 so um, the basic rule changes are you can't kick the ball out inside your own 45 anymore you have to kick the ball forwards uh, from sidelines except inside the uh, opposition 13 13 on the kickouts you can only have two people in midfield everybody else your six defenders have to be behind the 45 when the ball is kicked so it's like an offside rule for yeah. soccer, a little bit. Um, well, what else have I got? What else am I missing? Oh, Simbin. Uh, Simbin for two yellow cards. Yeah. I mean, so that's like, I can come back on after I do a yellow card tackle, which is like basically, I can kill you in some, in some games and get a yellow card. I can kill you again, yeah. and I'm still not sent off. I can come back on in 10 minutes. Yeah, the people who find issue with the black card won't be satisfied with this because the black card is still very much there. It's just instead of you being reduced, uh, or not being reduced at all, that player being replaced, you will be reduced to 14 men for a 10 minute period. So I think that's a better idea, actually. Like if the black card had been a 10 minute punishment as well as, as opposed to... But like, there's a serious problem with the actual implementation of the black card and what constitutes a black card foul. So that hasn't been addressed whatsoever in these playing rules. Granted, I know that we can't say all these little problems have to be addressed in, in, in this one sort of move. Uh, so I don't necessarily agree with that. I think sometimes you need incremental change, and I think maybe parts of this are positive. The other thing, um, you didn't mention, did you mention the hand passes? No, so a limit on three, three hand passes. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure about this. Like Mike Quirk is saying in the examiner this morning, it's a symptom rather than the actual genesis of the problem, which I would tend to agree with. When you look up and you see a mass defence, you're less likely to kick the ball into it than you are to hand pass to your mate beside you. So I think that is the reason why hand passing has become rampant in modern Gaelic football. And McGinley's going to join us a little bit later on to give us his thoughts. Um, there was some, there was some belief in the ether that this was an anti-Dublin thing to try and stop Dublin's dominance. Bullshit. But actually, there's also a belief in the ether that it's anti-Northern football because, you know, we all saw what happened in the uh, club match in Derry just recently when, you know, there was a bit of showboating, toe tapping going on inside their own half, and no one was coming out. Slot Neil just kept possession for like four minutes. If this is a targeting of Dublin, like it's actually hilarious. It, it's very, very funny. I, I, I would, I would like to see the face it's, of. It's the, not though. It isn't. It, it's not. But let's the, just say it wouldn't work. It clearly wouldn't work. I mean, this will will define sort of high catching once again. It will make it more of a skill in the game if it is implemented. It will play right into the hands of Brian Fenton and Michael Darren McCauley and Brian Howard. We've seen Brian Howard field high balls. He's not bad at uh, fielding high balls. About the uh, Gaelic football rule changes and I'm delighted to say we've got Enda McGinley on the line and Anthony Moyles on Skype as well. Anthony, I might start with you. One of the things that we've been asked to do is to consider these rule changes as a whole as opposed to breaking them down as individuals so that, you know, you might have an issue with one or two of them, but let's see how they all work in concert together. Is that a fair enough request from the Standing Rules Committee? Um, I don't think so, Jared, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I just kind of... I'm, look, I can see why people would feel the requirement or the need to try to do stuff um, and to try to change things. But at the same time, you know, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, you know, there's a, there's a number of people who are really clamoring for this, um, you know, and there's probably a number of high profile people who are kind of saying, you know, oh, change needs to come, change needs to come. And, and, and you know, for me, these short term fixes, these kind of quick fixes, shall we say, um, are sometimes, you know, it, it's all this kind of stuff of the unknown consequences, what actually can happen after it. 
Um, like I mean, you look you look at most sports, be it soccer, rugby, etc., basketball, NFL. Yes, there's changes that go on, but they are really, really, really well thought through. Um, they don't fundamentally change the basic kind of requirements or skills of the game. Um, and they might be just tinkering around the edge with certain things. Whereas, you know, it's nearly like every year, you know, especially football, it's like, okay, we just, we just have to bring in something really radical here and we have to nearly react, you know, to certain things that are going on or certain things that are being said in the media or certain things that are being said in punditry or whatever it is. Um, and it's, it's, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm more worried about that aspect of it than anything else in that it's kind of very reactionary rather than kind of sitting down. And I know they're trying to get ahead of the game here. But, like, I mean, some of this is, isn't new. You know, the sin bin has been there. I think I played in O'Burn Cup, I think, in 04, 05 in the sin bin trial. Um, and then you also have a situation, obviously, where I would find that the other things that are being asked to be brought in, that some of them will actually may even make the strong even even stronger. You know, so I think there's there has to be a question of well, what is the reason for this? Is the reason to try to level the playing field? Is the reason to try and make the game more attractive? Or is the game is the reason to get more competition, say, within the game and actually not have these one-sided games? And to be honest with you. Changing any amount of rules, bar you go out and you play Dublin with 12 players and the rest of the country with 15 players, um, nothing's really going to change there. You can mean all the standards have to be raised, which everyone knows about, and it's incumbent then on managers, it's incumbent on club coaches, it's incumbent on players themselves to realise that actually the levels that we need to get to um, are being set by the likes of Dublin. And it's not going to happen today or tomorrow, but it may happen over the next kind of five years, ten years. And to be fair, the likes of Tyrone, the likes of Galway, the likes of Kerry, the likes of even, you know, even Kildare and, you know, hopefully Mead. And they've, they've realised it's the last number of years and they are trying their best to get to those levels. Yeah, like uh, you, you kind of touched on it there. And I, and I was going to kind of ask just before we get into the rule changes about what the GEA is reacting to. You, you mentioned Dublin there. Do you really think that that is the single biggest reason why these rule changes have been proposed, that they've just seen a team do four in a row and they, they're therefore being reactionary on that level? It just seems very knee-jerk, Anthony. I, th I think as well, Owen, you have a situation, say, like, you know, the, 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 the coverage that came out there a couple of weeks ago with Schlott Neil, you know, and people see that and they're like, oh, that's an absolute joke. But, like, you know, okay, you know, maybe there's been many instances out in club games, but I go to a lot of club games here in Mead, and... You know, if you play with 14 men behind the ball, you generally get bet. And I don't think you'd last too long as a manager in a club with a bunch of players who are saying, you know what, I'm delighted to go down training for the whole year to end up playing in this type of system where we're keeping the score down to, you know, seven points to six or something like that. That's not what the game is about. Um, and you eventually get found out playing that. Like, you know, even Jim McGuinness was found out, to be fair. You know, like, you know, Dublin decided and, and thought of a way that they could get around that. And they did. So, you know, there's, there's, you have to, every game will have something where people say, like you take rugby a couple of years ago, it was all about, you know, the up and under. So scrum house would get it, to kick it up in the air. The opposition guys would catch it, they'd kick it up in the air. And it was all about trying to get this kind of, you know, uh, territory. But then the fellas realised, actually, this is just a bit of a waste of time. It's more of a lottery. So we'll actually attack players and we'll offload. So games do move. And I think that the game itself moves. I don't think necessarily as a rule change or as changing the rules, you have to say, okay, well, we changed, we altered the rules and therefore we will we will alter the game. Yeah. I think people will have to say, okay, this guy is bringing something new to me. Um, so what did Jim McGuinness bring? Okay, a packed defence. Well, how do we actually draw that defence out? How do we beat that defence? Whatever it is. So I just think it's, it's it's you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think it's reactionary really on just to Dublin. I think it's reactionary to a number of people getting on saying, oh, hurling is fantastic. Look at the excitement, blah, 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 blah. And listen, let's, let's not even go there. There's plenty of bad hurling games. Um, and yeah. it's all about football. And the football is dying on its feet. And, you know, I disagree. And uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, there's a lot of truth in what Anthony's saying. I think the reactionary thing, I think the biggest thing that usually kicks the GA into action, unfortunately, is is fall in interest and, and fall in, in money coming in through the gates. And I think that was borne out this year. I think that is a two-pronged thing. I think the, the almost inevitability of Dublin's progress through a lot of the games and then the general quality of fair, like I think the football has been poor. I was always a great believer in, in that it would evolve. This last while have sort of started to, to, 
to lose faith in that belief because I think the, the defence of that blanket defence is such an effective tactic that I don't see a particular reason for teams to go against it. I think the best teams are working with it. They're still getting, including Dublin, they're still getting multiple, multiple players behind the ball and then looking to break. The, the, the best teams are getting a finer balance within that. But I think that blanket defensive type thing and the football we see because of that, the, the static sort of solo and across midfield, the no pressure on people in the middle third at times whenever a team's all back. I think that is becoming a, a more of a feature of the game. Now, Drone changed it up towards the latter end of the year and went more man-to-man, so if more teams do that, maybe there's still time for the natural evolution to occur, but I think Croke Park are feeling under pressure to come out and do something, and this is their attempt. I'd agree you were asking Anthony there regarding to, to consider all these rules as one go. I'd be really worried about that. The last sort of sudden rule change we've seen was the black card, and... I think very few would think that it was fully thought through and the consequences and the knock-on effects of it was fully thought through. I think absolutely the same here again. Like You could pick holes, and I suppose that's the GA attitude. It's very easy to pick holes in every single one of them rule changes. I think for me, you have to believe that the committee are, are through gales behind it all, and they're working in the best interest of the sport, and they have taken lots of direction in terms of these. But I would just worry that, that some of the rules, the specifics of some of the rules, will have a knock-on effect uh, and could end up more negative, such as the fist pass and such as the only only a forward pass from the sideline ball or such as the forward mark. All of them, potentially as managers, you actually switch around to strengthening the argument for, for more defensive football. So I think we'll have to be very careful. We changed one rule with the black card and I didn't think it was particularly great to change five and six rules like this would, would be a big step. Uh, is, there, is there at least a case for them to do this in a year with the league and see what happens? And obviously, we will go back to the normal rules of the championship no matter what happens because there's been no Congress to change those rules. So that we could examine... Look, I, I see the point you're making. If the only being allowed to kick a sideline ball forward means that defense can, defenders can funnel back, knowing full well that whoever has the sideline ball has to kick the ball forward, and so suddenly the defending team has, has one more man to defend than the sideline uh, team because there's a man off the field off the field kicking it. The, the other stuff about like the men inside the 45. That means everybody just bunches up at the 45 and it becomes a little bit like um, an under sixes or an under eights match where everybody's just chasing the ball. Like you, you can see ways where this all falls down in practice, but we've got to try something, to your point, about the quality of fair not improving and also the defensive structures really being so dominant at the moment. Yeah, I'd agree. And I suppose on, on one half, I'm delighted to see that there is definite moves afoot to, to try something different. I suppose there will be some that will be said, just leave it alone and give it time. But I suppose I was in that camp. And my question is, how much time do we give it? Because the football has probably been poorer this year than, than, than we've seen in a long time. Maybe that's just a one-off year. Uh, I would agree with the hurling thing. We're, we're looking at hurling a wee bit too much. And in, in fairness, when you look at the rules, an awful lot of them seems to be trying to create a hurling game out of a football game, a big kick out into the middle and then from there, a big kick out into the full, full forward line. Uh, so I think we'll have to be cautious about that. Uh, but I think at least it's going to start a pretty earnest discussion. Uh, I think it's going to go out, obviously, to consultation now. I can't see all these rules being passed. If if all them rules come in, I think watching the National League, how and under God do you try to make sense of what 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 rules is working, what rules aren't working, because the teams themselves are only getting on to them too. Like county teams, the way they're trained at the minute, would need two and three years working with a particular big rule change to try and see what, what the eventual sort of outcome of that is to change five rules in the one National League and expect to see some sort of an outcome and some sort of a conclusion after seven games I think is rubbish when teams are still primarily targeting promotion or relegation so uh, there's no point bringing in big rule changes but kicking them all out after one National League I think we, we, we need to look at things a wee, a wee bit more uh, a, a wee bit closer and give things a wee bit longer yeah, no, that's a fair point. One one last question to you, Andy. I know you've got to go in just a second. Um, is the of the rules of the five rule changes, which is the the one that you'd have your biggest concerns about? Hey, the the fist passing one has always irked me. I, I cannot understand it. Limiting to three fist passes, I think people say, oh, it's a hand pass game rather than a fist pass game. But I played in loads of 
great games of football. I watched loads and loads of great games of football. All of them brilliant games of football that any of us that follows the game will remember. Fist passing had nothing to do with it. You know, I think of even, say, last year's Ireland final. Was anybody counting fist passes? It was a brilliant game of football. Think of any of them great classics down over the years that we all recall. Was any of us counting fist passes? No. So I think that's a... The, the fist passing is only a consequence of the the, the blanket defence. I'm not sure any of these rule changes actually address the blanket defence. Yeah. All right. And the great stuff. We'll let you go. Thanks a million. Uh, Anthony, anything different from that in terms of the, the whole notion of um, bringing five changes in for a league campaign when you know that managers are cycling through their squads in some instances, desperately trying to get promotion or keep a job in other instances, that really you would need two championship years of evidence to see whether or not a rule change has had any impact? Yeah, and I think, Gerard, it just adds, adds an awful lot of pressure, never mind even the actual adherence of the rules, right? So actually the referees, you know, and the observation of the rules. Like, I mean, we see we see the mess that the black card has created in various different guises and various different things. You go to club games and fellas are being roaring, like, black card for that, black card for this. You have it on the pitch with players, you have it on managers, you have it on sidelines. So you can imagine then that a referee is there pretty much, okay, you know, they say they're getting a lot more help from linesmen and from umpires, but let's say they're pretty much on their own and they're trying to have to now observe all this other stuff that's going on and da-da-da, the amount of hand pads. There's just going to be error, I think, upon error upon error. Um, I think I think the way to try to generate this is you nearly try to have to start to simplify things. Like, you know, football was pretty dire at certain parts of my career when it was just catch and kick, catch and kick. You know, you'd hear fellas who go on to TG Carr and watch some of the games during the 70s and 80s and they're like, oh my Jesus, what was that? You know, <laughs> fellas just getting the ball and hoofing for as long as they can, or as far as they can. So sometimes there is a demand, and I don't know if it's an insatiable type of appetite that we have at the moment where everything is clips and everything is short streaming stuff. So, you know, you look at a game of soccer and you see 10 highlights, which look fantastic. But if you're sitting there for the 90 minutes, you might be, you know, boring a hole in your head watching the thing because it might be an absolutely terrible game. So everything has kind of become this instant gratification. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that Gaelic football does not need help, but... There is, I think, an awful lot of focus on it. And, you know, even, you know, you just say there, you know, there has been, it's been a poor season. Like, I've gone to a fair few games this year and I've really, really enjoyed them. And I think sometimes, you know, I think there's three things that a team has to have. And if you look at Dublin, you know, physically they are probably the most prime team in, in, in the country, right? Regardless now of, you know, funding and all this, let's, let's just look at the facts where they are at the moment. So physically they are the, the, the fittest the strongest, the most conditioned, etc. Skill-wise, they're probably the best in the country as well, right? So they're skillfully the best. They can they can execute the ball skills and whatever they need to do better than any other team on a more consistent fashion. And tactically, they are more astute than any other team in the country. So Jim Gavin and his backroom team will look at an opposition team, will look at the way a team are playing, and they will set up and they will alter during the game. You know, we've spoken about this, Jason Sherlock running out after 15 minutes of a game, telling Cluxon to alter kickouts, telling the forwards to push up or drop off, whatever it is. So they're, they're the nuances that happen within the game. Now, the rest of the country then, you know, Mayo, whoever else, they have to first of all get to number one and two, which is you have to be physically able to beat them and stay with them. How many times in the 2000s or the late 2000s you heard teams saying, oh, well, if they weren't fit enough and Dublin just blew them away in the last 10 minutes. You don't hear that anymore anymore. Teams have to develop panels that are not just 15, 16, 17 lads. They have to be 24, 25 lads who are capable of playing in that cauldron against Dublin. Then you move and you move on abilities and skill and everything else and honing in on that because obviously if you're playing county football, you have a level of skill. And then the last one, which is the big one, is is tactically, how do I beat them? And you see with Mickey Hart this year, you know, he started to press them from both sides, both both the defenders pressing up against them and the forwards pressing in against them. So, so to stop this lateral movement of the ball, they tried to squeeze and press that area. Now, that is a brilliant move. It's a basketball move, but it's a brilliant move to try and all of a sudden break that down. So that's just a guy thinking. It's not a rule change. It's not someone saying, oh, no, we can't go back with the ball. Mm. It's just somebody saying, actually, this is how I'm going to get the ball back. And this is how I'm going to apply pressure, as Enda says, one-on-one. -on -one. Now, unfortunately... 
for unfortunately for Dublin, there are not that many counties who are able to match them on all of that. So what do most management teams do? They say, OK, well, we can't get number one and number two up to the level of Dublin. So we get number three. And number three is tactically, how do we strategically, how do we set up? And the answer is you just park the bus. It's happened in soccer for years. It's even happened in, you know, defensive wise in rugby for years. So you just park the bus and you say, we keep the score down. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, we get a bit of luck and we'll pick them off. So Jesus, Jack Charlton did it for donkey's years with us, you know, and we all heard of that stuff. So, you know, so it, it's, look, I can see why people are trying to change. I can see why, you know, incremental change. But, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worried. I think the game is is suffering from a lot bigger issues than just rule changes. Like, I mean, let's not even start to fix your stuff. Well, that um, is, I, sorry, you know, I, I think actually it's worth it's worth pointing that out. And um, it was a, a point that Mick Quirk made in a kind of smaller um, example in his piece in The Examiner today when he said that this is addressing the symptoms, or sorry, this is not addressing the symptoms. This is addressing the symptoms, but not the cause mm. of uh, the issue when he was talking about the hand passing. But specifically, the notion of changing the rules to make the game better, like, the issue is the broken fixture list. The issue is the inequalities within the system where Leitrim and Dublin are playing in the same championship and the game is the same game for those two teams. And the expectation is that somehow we have a, a championship and a league that puts teams up against each other in fixtures that don't make any sense. Like, if, if you put the teams up against each other who had the same level of resources and the same level of uh, tradition and the same level of talent coming through, the game is actually really good in those games. The Division 3 matches where the two teams are fairly similar, the Division 2 matches in the league where the two teams are, are fairly similar, those matches were really good. There was a score in them like at various stages. The quality of football was excellent when both teams tried to win the matches. It's when you have this imbalance where there is like one of the best club teams in the country against a team who is going to get hammered by them if they go out. That's when you see what you got in the slot meal game. Absolutely. And, and the thing about it is, Ger, you don't hear much of this clamouring going on after the league or even during the league. You know, people were very happy of the league the last few years because, as you say, you have like versus like. You know, you don't have a situation where you've got the, the behemoth versus this and they're just knocking the living daylights out of people. So, like, I mean, that is where th this is exactly it's trying to, you know, you're tinkering around the edge with this where actually the core of this, the core of football is, is, is rotten. Um, and it's rotten all the way down to the club game. You know, and I mean, the GA authorities, you talk about hurling and all, oh, there's great, fantastic games in hurling. There's not that many fantastic games in hurling in April, May, when they play off the old, whatever it's called now, the Christie Ring or whatever, and they get rid of the lesser teams. And next thing, they have all the big names and everyone focuses on the big names. And of course, there's going to be good names because most of them are at a level. They're pretty close. You know, so there's excitement, there's close, close matches, all the rest of that stuff, because it's pretty much... You know, as I say, both of them are, are, are pretty close. Most teams are pretty close at that stage. But if you have a situation, as you say, fixture lists, you know, don't even get me started with all that stuff. You know, so you have drop off. You have, you know, guys deciding that actually this, this isn't for me. You have all those different things. And then you go up into the inter-county scene and you have, you have teams that are, as you say, playing way out above their, their league in the championship with nothing to play for. Sure, this kind of stuff is going to happen. You know, you're going to get one side of games. You're going to get, you know, a, 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 a position where teams and guys are saying, sure, sure, what am I playing the game for? Like, where is the where is the potential that I can actually, you know, win something yeah. or I can actually achieve with this? So that that stuff, that's for me, that's what has to be focused on. And I think if this is a kind of a bit of a sideshow going on here. You know, this is what has to be fixed. And we're still waiting, by the way. We are still waiting. Like we, like the CPA there, and I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't come on just to keep, but we, we asked for, and we were brought in, you know, everyone to sit down, vested interests, sit down, let's, you know, get a, get a, get a, get a, get a, a blank sheet, and let's look at this thing from top to bottom, and let's get a, get, let's get the, the, the season sorted out. Let's allow, you know, areas where clubs can then go, okay, now we can know what we need to do. And let's actually start to enhance the game. And let's start to get kids and everyone else enjoying the game. And guys of 19, 20, 21, 22, that they want to play till they're 35, not deciding at 21 or 20, actually, I've had enough of this and I'm going off and playing social soccer or social rugby or whatever it is. Yeah, fair enough. Anthony, great stuff. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm right, cheers, lads. Anthony Moore is there. Yeah, like, it's, it's so true when you say that this... 
isn't the main issue. I do think that rule change is required on some level, and it may be a future direction to go, but ultimately you look I, at just... Sorry, just on that, I think rule change is always, in every sport, you should have a standing rules committee who every year are going, right, what happened, how did this work, let's, let's experiment with this. This is like, in, in all sports, you're constantly evolving the rules. But the notion that this is somehow going to fix the, the tyranny of defensive football that we're struggling with at the moment, it just doesn't make any sense. It's always... I don't want to use the term always, but for the most part, when you talk about that mass defence or these really dour attempts trying to win a game, it is always a team trying to play up to the opposition that is clearly far superior. You look at the great games this summer, like Ross Common Armagh, arguably game of the year because two teams were of a similar level. Even the games that wouldn't be construed as classics, far, far from classics, the likes of, uh, let's say... Leitrim Dub- in New York. Well, th- that's, that's a good point, but like Tyrone against Dublin, Tyrone against Donegal, um, even Monaghan against Kildare in Croke Park were, I think, totally, enjoyable games. Totally acceptable level of like, exactly. and th- going for it. That, is, like, that would be what I would consider to be the target average for a game, but in the context of the season just gone by, they're probably far above the average in terms of the quality of spectacle. And there is only one reason why that average is so low, and it is because teams are going to get walloped unless they play in a certain way. And even when they do play in that certain way, they still get walloped. It just doesn't look as dramatic. Yeah, I think it might look worse. I, I, there is, like, so the law of unintended consequences is, is hugely important. What you might now be able to do is find a goalkeeper who can welly the ball, or somebody in your full back line who can welly the ball, two tall midfielders who can catch the ball, two tall inside forwards who can catch the ball, and suddenly you have a team. Mm. Like, ping, ping. Is this really what we want? Uh, well, you, like, just to get into the nitty gritty of it, what you said earlier on is actually kind of true that you line up two, your, your players, you, you line them up in the 45, and while the ball's in the air, you manage to, to gather in the middle of the field, and maybe the two midfielders won't actually cause that much of, a, of an influence. Well, I, I, so just about the, um, the, the kick out and the zoning is mad complicated, right? For a kick out, two players only from each team shall be positioned between the two 45 meter lines. The goalkeeper and a maximum of six players from each team shall be behind the respective 45 meter lines. A maximum of six players shall be behind. Okay, okay, well, so. It can only be six. Because well, it has to be six at the other end of the other yeah. 45. So there's no minimum. Uh, okay, Grant. Unless, can you be off the pitch and run on? I, I don't know. I, I, I certainly don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so there's two polls running uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Would you go for any of these rule changes? Suggested rule changes. Hand pass restriction, 21%. Kick out zoning, 17%. The mark for the attacking players, 31%. And the sim bin, 31%. So... Uh, would you go for any of the pre- proposed GAA rule changes uh, on Twitter? It was uh, OTVM live right now. The attacking mark, 32%, 35% the sim bin, 10% zonal kickouts, 23% restricting hand passes. Part of me always feels like as well that like the committee are dyed in the wool GAA men. They know exactly what's going on here, right? So you bring all these in, you start the debate, and you get one or two through. I don't know which of the one or two that... Like which one's the Trojan horse for everything else? Well, that's the thing. Also, another problem I have, just with regards to the conversation we just had, these are going to be trialled in league games where everybody's of a similar standard. There is a very big danger that they're trialled in the league and it's like, all those games were really good and yeah. it, was, it was a decent spectacle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because it's the league and it's the best competition we have in Gaelic football. Yeah. Uh, Pat Gallagher on uh, Twitter says, Can somebody explain how restricting the number of hand passes helps the game? It won't stop the over and back pitch stuff as it will be easy to kick past doing this. It's going to stop free-flowing attacks when teams run the ball at speed through the hands. It's a stupid idea. Kick the ball backwards as well. Yeah, uh, so um, in order here, Juan Jose on YouTube says, were there any current players, managers, referees on the panel that devised the list of potential changes? There were. You've got the list of um, the committee there. And it's like, in fairness, it's a really good committee of committed GAA people. Yeah, it is. It's, I may as well just read out uh, the list of people for anybody who missed it. It's David Hassan is the chair, uh, Tracy Bunning is the secretary, and then the other members are Pat Daly, Seamus Kenny, Brian Cuthbert, Michael Delaney, David Collins, Alex McQuillan, and Frank Murphy. So uh, varying degrees of people involved with county boards, former GAA. coaches, GPA. GAA. Uh, so th- there is a well-rounded thing, of course. The intentions are good in this. There's no question about it. Uh, Deller Beller says, forget the sin bin, just award a 13 metre free for yellow and black cards regardless of where the foul takes place. I absolutely agree with that. That, that changes the game completely. 
that there's a 30 metre free every time um, a yellow card or a black card offence is committed. Yeah, it does. It, like it's it's one of a number of it's free it's free throws in basketball and it stops fouling and it makes the game even. It it gets rid of all the nastiness. It gets rid of the the jawing and the gouging and the jersey pulling. It's like no, I saw that. That's a yellow card off. That's a yellow card and a 30 meter free. It transforms the sport immediately. I think. It does. It, it does transform the sport. It doesn't mean it's the right idea. Why not? Is it? What's wrong with it? Though? Is it too positive? Why? Like if you like uh, over a yellow card that maybe isn't deliberate. Granted, there's only going to be whatever six or seven yellow cards per team in a match. It's not going to. Well, let's let's make yellow cards for deliberate or uh, reckless fouls. Mm. Like you can change what becomes a yellow card. So a black cards fairly obvious. That's a, a free. Maybe it, maybe it's just for black cards. Maybe yellow cards. But like at some level, deciding that your foul costs your team a score changes. The complexion entirely. I yeah. think. Yeah. No. It's it's true. There, if there is certainly a, a very big argument to to implement something like that, where you're bringing the ball up a huge uh, portion of the field, whether or not it's for all black and yellows, I'm not sure. Definitely for a black, I would think would be the correct call. Uh, you could try, you could trial it with the black and then see if you move it to yellow. Uh, listening from Australia, the AFL are going to love these rules, says Hugo Fallon. I mean, it's true. Suddenly, there will be players used to, like, conditioned from the time that they're 15 to be high fielders, catchers, markers, and kickers. It's like, oh, you're you're deciding that this is going to be uh, an entire academy system for our professional sport over here in Australia. Thanks very much, lads. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's early coming. Like, are people not trained that way anyway? Like, we're, we're not training. Not really. We're not training kids into a system. Well, you 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 would be like if it's like catch, kick, catch, kick. I mean, at, at what point also does then anybody under five foot eleven, six foot one stop being useful to you? Do you just decide, right, you can't be a defender because you're marking guys that are too big. You can only play in the half back and half forward line, but actually even then you're kind of useless to us. I think you're overplaying the whole zonal formation of the kickouts. A I don't think so. I think it's like it's a it's a mad constellation. So how many kickouts are there in the game? Is it twenty odd? I would say over twenty. Yeah. So like. So that's 40, 20 for each team. So that's 40 times a match, everybody goes into formation and then punches out. Yeah, like, I, the, the idea that all these balls are going to be caught clean... It becomes a bit of a ballet. Yeah, but... They won't, be, they won't all be caught clean, fair enough. Well, the, thi the thing is with the, the zone of formation, it's actually limiting the amount of places that the kick-out can go. It's limiting into this very small... Uh, in, in a lot of cases, say, let's say it's senior club football, it's going to be between the 45-metre line and the halfway line. That's where it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, like, therefore, yeah. you're bunching things even more. Like, the ball is in the air, everybody's running into this little zone. There's going to be tons more breaks, perhaps, than there ordinarily would be, because there is no breaks with short kickouts. Uh, so, what? the little man is, oh, like, survives in that. The, the, the Paul Do Calvin would thrive in, in this environment. Yeah, I mean, he's not little. Like, like he's, not, he's not Kieran Donaghy either. You were saying everybody has to be six foot two, prime for the AFL. So, I don't know, I just think it was like, even the way that the Galway hurling team have evolved to like, everybody's six foot four, like, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I'm just suggesting that there's an unint unintended consequence there where there's a massive premium now on those tall players who can catch the ball. Massive premium. Yeah. You, especially if you can play in the full forward line because... Does Owen Merchant last in the Dublin full back line under these rules? I mean, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't think so. Because you, you will now have, like, if Aidan O'Shea is coming up now, he is probably in the full forward line, yep. because every time he catches the ball, it's a score. Yeah. The RLC, it's, if you've got an, an extreme version of Aidan O'Shea, he's going up for a few kickouts, and he, he, doesn't even, he doesn't even negotiate the two areas between no, the 45 never. and the 20. No, you're never there. You're, like, in midfield. The field or in the full forward yeah. line, whatever And 40 times a match, that's useful to you. So, like, of course you're going to do that. There, there's truth in what you're saying, for sure. I, I do think that the idea that the, it's going to lead to a lot more clean catching and stuff, I'd like to see it in practice first. Yeah. I'm just trying to think in my own head how quickly can players bunch from a position outside of a zone with which you're not allowed to enter at a certain point. But they're, so they're, they're lined up on the line. That's, yeah. That, I, and as I soon as the ball is kicked... They're bunching. It's very hard to catch a clean ball in a bunched area like that, is what I'm saying. Uh, the hand pass restriction won't work. A man's on into space with a soft hand pass. Sorry, they could start by properly defining the tackle, says Virginia, uh, which is a good point. Uh, it's all about restricting Dublin rather than eliminating defensive play, says uh, How's That. 
I really hope like, that's really not the motive behind it. I, I don't really know. I think not. that I think that people's issues. I think that all of this comes down to the crappy championship structures that we have that have allowed one team to be so much better than everybody else, and the other teams have de designed defensive structures to try and beat that team. Yes, and that's been copied by the rest of the system because they see it on TV and they see it being successful. And the problem is that you have this structure which is completely lopsided. Like, you can't bring a gun to a knife fight and every county in the championship that's playing a first division team that isn't a first or second division team is going in completely unprotected by the system. So of course you're going to build a defensive structure that allows you to somehow retain some semblance of credibility when you go back in there. Mm -hmm. Any of those teams you can go, oh, we're not going to change our style of play just because we're playing Dublin. It's like, well, 7.23 to no score. Well done, Lance. Congratulations. So do you think that instead, and I, to be honest with you, I'm not asking this to sort of kind of like sarcastically or anything because part of me agrees with this. Do you think that we should then be making these radical changes but on a structural point of view in terms of championship structures? That if they're able to say, here are five crazy things, P people want radical change. And I like that way of thinking, yeah. but should they be thinking in terms of structure, let's just say to themselves, right, let's try out uh, one summer, let's just try out an A, B, C championship. Yeah. Completely throw out the, let's postpone the provincial championships yes. for one summer yes. and let's see how it looks. A hundred percent. I would be in favour of that. I think like you would need to sell it and sell it hard to the Division 2 and the Division 3 teams, but like, there's an easy way to do that if you plan it out properly. But let's just go to Munster Council, Leinster Council, Ulster and Connacht and say, listen, we're not getting rid of your provincial championships. Can we please just try for one year to see what would happen if we had not league format, but a tiered structure on an All-Ireland Championship basis in the middle of the summer? Like, let's just see how it would work. Is it worth then perhaps, you know, letting go of these twee ideas that are provincial championships? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But letting go, that is the problem. Maybe for one summer they might. Quickly here, Owen Kyo says, maybe it's time for teams and counties to just accept the GA has evolved into a game that possession of the ball actually gets you results and not punting into the mix so you're a six foot four player. I mean, I think that's a fair point. Obviously, there are times when a little bit of chaos in the full forward line is a beautiful thing and it works still in soccer. Like, <clears throat> you know, you stick the big lad up front for the last 10 minutes and see what happens. The, yeah, like the, the chaos can still exist. It'll just be a, a broken ball as opposed to a clean catch. Tons of sense there from Anthony Moyles. Uh, Darren Doherty says, uh, Rugby has modelled rule changes year on year. Some have worked and some haven't, but at least they are addressed. I, but there's a standing rules committee now, and in fairness, this is what they're doing. That's the whole point of this. Uh, Ronan Fitzgerald says, The rule changes are completely arbitrary and absurd. The GA needs to let the game move forward towards the more tactical styles that have emerged. These rules are as if they want to force it back. There is a little bit of, um, of that, Ronan, and I think the trouble is that we don't have a culture of full-time professional coaches which every other global sport has. There are full-time basketball coaches coming up with new and innovative ways to, um, to counteract whatever changes happen in the game. At the moment, all of the changes in the GAA world are essentially coming from the full-time coaches at uh, colleges level, at Sigerson level. They're the ones who are kind of getting the inter-county players, putting them together, have a little bit of time to work with them and come up with some innovations. But they play in the shittest of shit weather, mm. and so it's very hard to see exactly what that would look like in high summer. Um, Joe Passmore says, loads of good points made by Anthony Moyles. Was he asked, for example, to contribute to group consultations? Also, rule changes typically implemented incrementally and quickly here, so the GEA can legislate quickly outside Congress when it suits. Now, what about fixtures? What about fixtures? What, what about, about the fixtures? Indeed. And then Jamie Wall,